Good day to everyone tuning in and welcome to another episode of MCL Talks where we discuss and engage in conversations around composition as a creative process. We are the founding members of the Manila Composers Lab and before we begin today's talks, I'll invite everyone to introduce themselves so I'll actually start off with mine. Uh, my name is Juro Kim Feliz, a composer based here in Toronto, and I graduated. I studied composition at the University of the Philippines and at McGill University. Ako, I'm uh, Jonas Baez. I am the founder of the MCL, and I am located here in UP Diliman. I live nearby, near UP Diliman. I'm Alexander John Villanueva. Uh, people call me AJ, I'm a composer and conductor, and... Uh, uh, a lecturer in the University of the Philippines, and uh, also one of the founding members of the Manila Composers Lab and artistic director of the Ripian Ensemble. Hi, I'm Feliz and Reyes Makahis. I'm currently living in Graz, here in Austria, and I'm a doctoral candidate at Kunz Universität Graz. I'm Pauline Arejola, and I graduated from the UP College of Music, Bachelor of Music, major in voice. And I currently teach uh, preschool music, but I'm first and foremost a soprano and a performer, and I also sing with the Ripiano Ensemble. I'm the project coordinator of, the, of MCL. I'm Marie Louise Calvero. I'm also one of the founding members of the Manila Composers Lab. I am currently based in Freiburg and I am a lecturer for electronic music at the Hochschule für Musik in Freiburg. My name is Dominic Ada. I studied uh, music in, I studied composition in the University of the Philippines under Jonas Paez, uh, Ramon Santos. The Musik Hochschule Lübeck with uh, Dieter Mach. I am currently working for Egosoft making computer games. So we'll actually start uh, listening to AJ, who's actually giving a talk today about his uh, work and all that. Uh, so just to give uh, some more background about AJ, he's uh, again, he has already mentioned, he's already, a, he's a composer and a conductor based in the Philippines. And he finishes, uh, finished studies at the University of the Philippines College of Music. He's uh, currently the conductor and artistic director of the Rim Piano Ensemble who specializes in 21st century contemporary music. And he has already works premiered by notable ensembles, including Nenberg, Ensemble Mosaic, Ensemble Chant de Kut, Hanoi New Music, Ensemble Kai Fatahila, and others as well. As a conductor, he has also conducted works on Conrado del Rosario, Jonas Baez, and other Southeast Asian young composers as well. So let's all give the floor now to AJ. Maybe before we um, go into a discussion, maybe let's just listen to the piece. Uh, it's a very old piece, I think, for me. I uh, wrote this in 2011. It's been nine years. And I think I haven't listened to it um, maybe in the past five or six years. So let's listen to it.
So it's for flute, clarinet, piano, violin, cello, bass, two, gender, and three, saron. And uh, during that time, um, um, I was writing a lot of threnodies. Uh, so this is the fourth, uh, all of which were premiered, I think. Uh, so the premiere of this piece of Threnody 4 was in Bandung, Indonesia, on the 8th of October, 2011, performed by the renowned Ensemble Mosaic and Ensemble Kiai Fatahila. And uh, the piece was amazingly chosen by 10 internationally famed jury compo comprising of composers from different parts of Southeast Asia and Germany. It's one of the three festival winners of the Young Composers in Southeast Asia Competition and Festival 2011, which was sponsored by the Goethe Institute. This piece, 384, during that time, uh, of, uh, I think, March 20. Yeah, when I wrote this, May 2011, um, uh, all, of, all, of, all of the threnodies were unintentionally meant to be performed or to be heard outside of the Philippines, uh, except for the second one. So the first threnody is for violin, cello, and piano. It's a trio uh, that I also entered in a competition. Uh, uh, no, I think um, it was in the Asian Composers League in Tel Aviv, Israel. I remember... Uh, Juro Kim was there and he listened and recorded it illegally in his cell phone. <laughs> Threnody 2 um, um, is for piano and trombone uh, performed by a Swiss duo who came in the Philippines uh, I think July 2011 for the Manila Composers Lab as well. Threnody, Threnody 3 is a clarinet and cello duet um, uh, I think it was premiered during the inaugural concert of the Riviano Ensemble, if I remember it correctly, 2015, yeah. Um, and last, Friday 4, was performed in Indonesia three times, in Bandung, in uh, Yogyakarta, and in Jakarta. So this series depicted state of situations around me and my family. A uh, series that I wrote in reaction, confusion, anger, anxiety, shock, uh, injustice, loss, uh, events that emerge up to the point of uh, shaking, shaking relational foundations in the, our family uh, way back in 2011. So my grandfather died during that year, 2011, due to a massive heart attack. Actually, thinking about it now, it seems to be so far of an event again i was telling you guys earlier but there is more relevance to it um now listening to it and uh, relating some of my music of my recent music to it but uh, going back to that to to what they've written my grandfather was surviving on spare tires for uh the last 13 or 14 years before that was triple bypass the decade before that. Uh, it was a time of insecurity, a time of a lot of questions, revealing pasts and lost secrets. I'm, I'm cringing right now trying to remember um, some stuff, but that's what happened. Uh, I feared my grandfather, um, even though he was just five feet, his voice as frail as any old dying man. But when he thinks, it's like he pierces through your heart. For almost 20 years, he literally disowned my mother, her daughter, pushing us aside to the point that I almost believed that I had no other grandparents. Uh, after my paternal grandmother died, he believed in something that was not true. So the, the usual family feud, but this was much more intense than that. Uh, when uh, when my mother was young, he uh, she 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 was the favorite. She was called the apple of the eye of my grandfather, something like that. But then she was disowned. So you know, a tide soon turned, coin flipped. Uh, when my grandmother died, in 2006, that was the time that when that my grandfather um, I learned a lot. Uh, of uh, um, 
false things running in the family. So, that in a time when our family seemed like so many things were left hanging, so many things were left undiscovered, uh, with this death also died answers to our questions, which gave birth to more questions, more confusion, and more anxiety. And so this piece is a memoriam of the father's death that opened eyes for more people to see beyond his love, uh, to hear in his silence, to feel more in his absence. At least during that time, that's what it meant to me. Again. I don't know, maybe we can also discuss later or there's a certain music you've written before that made different, and I know you wrote it in a different context, but now you see it in another context. This is one of those pieces. And so the title of this, Trinity, song and, a song of lamentation and dear, an elegy. So these are my reflections. And now, um, um, these are my reactions, my struggles, my inner battles. Or I could have just, um, you know, uh, let it happen or let it slip away. But um, uh, I've become, during that time, I've become so reflex reflective of everything. And uh, I was young that time. I was in my fourth year of my undergrad study. Um, but uh, it was that time that I realized that away from the ramblings of what is reality, in that silence, there is more conflict. So we are constantly distracted by the hallucinations of our memories, our past. Different ideas, different composers, different influences made me find myself in that, um, uh, in that context. Uh, it all started when I was first year, second year. <laughs> enjoying illegally downloaded copies by one of the senior students, I think that's Grenick, or myself <laughs> of composers, which I now call my forefathers. I would always listen to Ravel, especially Smirwa. Please help me, uh, French speakers. Piano Suite, especially La Vallée de Cloche, Valley of the Bells. And um, thinking about the start of that piece, that, that, that G-sharp, it's a, it's a piano. I think I took that. I, I loved that idea so much, that one note idea so much. That I took it here, if you remember the piece. And until now, I, I, also, I also remember I have another piece around this time also. Um, Prayer of Stillness, uh, played by Juro Kim Feliz and sound by Stephanie Quintin. It, oh, I, I was just playing around with ideas of one note. I think I got it from uh, Ravel. So the Valley of the Bells, it's a very reflexive piece of work. Uh, it, and uh, it's so reflexive and uh, that it can be very transparent, I think. And uh, his use of very simple materials. Another French uh, piece, help me out. Uh, Messiaen's Quartet for the End of Time, uh, especially the fifth piece, the fifth piece, uh, Praise to the Eternity of Jesus in English, by the way, and um, how that repeating uh, rhythm from the piano, very simple, it drives the whole thing forward. And during that time, it, I found it very... That, that's, for, that's for cello and piano, right? The, the fifth piece, yeah. Fifth piece, yes. yeah. And how the lines from the cello and violin uh, is fantastically colored by the piano, and how the piano moves seamlessly through time as it almost paints a picture of the radiance of Jesus. Um, the brevity, another composer, the fullness of Weber's works, which is the best example of how distraction should be. And uh, I say distraction because if you don't listen for it for 30 seconds, that's two movements already. <laughs> For his case, plainly, plainly to complexly colorful, just like the third movement of the five pieces for orchestra. Um, BACH motif of JS. I'm just trying to enumerate what I think um, made me write all of this. And uh, hopefully I can try to connect it to now. 
BACH motif of Jace Bach used in the last contrapuntus of his Art of the Few where the germ idea B, A, C, and B flat became the basis of a very beautiful but incomplete fugue. Uh, again, the simplicity of materials. Um, Lachenmann, as he also used the same concept of the B, A, C, H in his first string quartet, Gran Torso, where then, and we analyzed this in, uh, I'm not sure, composition class at that. Um, I learned to play around with a simple structure just based on a very simple idea where he also used the concept of distraction, simply contrasting between long notes that mutate over the duration of the piece and short distracting notes that also mutate over the duration of the piece. And trying to remember all of it, um, uh, in the piece, there's so much of all of those composers, I think. Okay. So, um, well, first and foremost, the score looks like this because it was intended to be performed without a conductor when we started to write it. Well, let me talk about first the, the, the context of why I wrote this piece. Of course, it's, a, it's for a competition. Um, and then the instrumentation was for uh, Sundanis Gamilan and for um, uh, Western instruments. So we were free to choose whatever we wanted. And uh, of course, uh, wanted, to, wanted to experiment. I, I, at that point, I've written a lot of ensemble pieces so I'm quite, um, I was quite familiar with the Western instruments, but I was really afraid of um, writing for um, non-Western instruments. And uh, I think I was worried, well, I think the, the most important, should I consider writing for something that I haven't even seen? <laughs> so, um, so we wrote for that. Uh, in the website of uh, Goethe Institute, I think they they had resources there for notation and video clips of the gamelan instruments. So I, it made it a little bit easy. So I wrote for uh, two gender and three saron without even knowing if they really read Western instruments or not. But it seems they they have written Western instruments. And I'm, I'm saying this because um, uh, I wanted to talk about syntax. When I think about syntax, I think of um, language first. If one is to communicate correctly, the syntax is to be in a particular order, right? So in my mind, um, syntax just means the order of the process and the goal is to make sense out of all of that. Well, what I did was, uh, originally I just thought of an idea. And uh, I shared with you that it came from this, th these different, different composers. Again, going back to the piece, it was total chaos and it's start. And all of them pulled together or being tried to be pulled in a in some sort of order by the piano. So pretty much just like how um, uh, Messiaen used the piano in the fifth and eighth movement of the quartet for the end of times and how reflective uh, Ravel used the piano, the G sharp in the start of the Volet de Cloche. In the piece, I, I tried to imagine that the chaos is always happening. Piano always pulling it together, but always the, the other instruments, the chaos always recurs. And uh, that's the idea for the whole piece. It's very 
very simple. It's in a way, it's an overlay of what the piano is doing. And then afterwards, just transfer to the gamelan. The idea is always there. The idea, the instruments are just there to support that idea. That's what I, that's, that's how I would write until now. I could use the same idea for different instruments. I could use the same idea for choir, whatever. We got into the competition, me and we rehearsed. And uh, surprisingly, there was a conductor, Robert H. Platz, who was the student of Stockhausen. It's a, it was a very nice experience because uh, it wasn't my first time seeing other people's works or hearing other people's works, but I think that was my first time uh, having any involvement with the real ensemble. So it was quite an experience. There was a day in that competition where we needed to quote unquote defend our work. I think I came out well. <laughs> Because I was just grounded with simple materials, I think. I wanted it, I wanted the piece to be very crisp in terms of form. So you can really hear each new section. Uh, I use the piano like, uh, like how very simple a downbeat of a piano can become the start of a new section. I, I remember comments from some people before that it, 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 it sounded like Mozart in a way because of how clear the form was. I think syntax has also to do some, has something to do also with, um, well, vocabulary in language. If we know how words function and if you, um, you know, use another word for that word, same function. So it has the same, the, the whole sentence can have the correct syntax and, and your message will come across, people will understand you. And um, I think it was during this time that my, myself as a composer, uh, that I had my, my, my roots really grounded and I had my um, identity and I think that um, having this concrete ground and this syntax is what I have been developing still now I think we can go on with our discussion I'm excited with your questions because I, I myself am trying to understand myself in 2011 you know so it was Quite a, quite a long time ago when you have uh, phases of your life as a, comp as a composer as short as, you know, one to two years and then uh, the next two or three years you are enamored with another idea and you develop it for the next, you know, three months or six months and you develop it another year and then you t you're enamored with another idea. So. Um, maybe for, you know, Dr. Bai's nine years seems to be short, but for a composer who started writing at 2007, 2008, it's a long time ago. So we have heard uh, uh, AJ talk about his piece already before, mm -hmm. and to summarize all of it, uh, we have come up with certain key points to actually discuss about uh, as again like the previous talk we did last time there's this aspect of personal narrative mm -hmm. where the, the piece actually already uh, functions as a sort of memorial as well and mm -hmm. kind of embodies like a certain and, all that. and I think that's a very interesting thing to still like ponder on and to talk about as composers um, I love this term as well uh, because I've employed it in my teaching as well. Uh, so I will use the term contact tracing. <laughs> it's very appropriate. <laughs> very appropriate. <laughs> we actually, uh, from based, uh, based on AJ's talk, we actually uh, learned about the influences, right? Uh, Ravel, Avision, uh, Webern, Lachenmann, and probably many others that were not mentioned 
And also not even in terms of musical influence, but also like extra musical uh, factors that uh, kind of like uh, gravitated towards the creation of this work. In terms of syntax, we came upon the ideas of uh, having the notion of simplicity governing uh, all of the elements, and also in terms of instrument, probably color as well, and also the use of non-Western instruments. And I think that that's really also a very intriguing point to talk about. Too. So let's open the floor for comments now. At this point. Well, one comment. I like the syntactic clarity of the piece. And um, syntax in the sense, um, I'm thinking of syntax in the sense of it being a logical system of rules um, in which symbols are ordered to make a language coherent. And um, what's remarkable in our music always is that we have to define this syntax at the same time that we're defining the symbols mm. because these symbols don't exist yet before you start listening to the music. And I think precisely because of the simplicity of these symbols, the syntax, and the way that these symbols are used very, very, very consistently in the music, the syntax emerges very, very clearly. But speaking of symbols and syntax, um, Maybe one point of argument argument can be the notation of the gamelan because uh, it's not it's notated uh, like how we would notate for a piano, but it I'm sure it doesn't sound like that, you know. But that's the best symbol that we can give to that non-Western instrument, I think. Syntax is a very, seems to be a very basic thing in music because it's a structural uh, entity, right? Uh, uh, it, 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 it gives meaning to the very basic sounds, the base, very basic vocabularies. Uh, uh, and, and you see this very basic vocabularies to have, to acquire meaning because of the syntax. It's just words. Uh, have acquired its meaning from being used in sentences, which is, is a syntactic structure in itself, or that sounds, ba, 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 diphthong, diphthong, whatever, uh, have meanings also in terms of words. And, and apparently, I found this piece rather remarkable because it's able to, to create its own syntax without actually uh, without actually annihilating uh, how the gamelan syntax actually works i mean uh, the gamelan syntax if you would remember can be seen in terms of its uh, system of punctuations the the notion of punctuation in gamelan and this we are using a uh, sundanese tradition here and but it's still the same it's it's like uh, it's like in between Java and Bali, okay. So, but uh, in in the tradition, in this oral tradition, orally transmitted kind of uh, musical practice, um, the most important thing is is syntax, syntactic structure, because that's how the musicians they index practice in their minds. It's like they're talking and there's a grammar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There have been so many studies about this, even from the 80s. Uh, I've always admired Judith and Alton Becker's notion of, uh, but I, I'm working on something now which has to do with naturalness anyway, and syntax. And, and apparently in, in this piece, my, my, the, 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 the thing which I always remember, I, I, what struck me even during that time when I was listening to it during the competition, I've never forgotten it is that somehow if you look at syntax in terms of punctuations, in this piece, punctuations are at the foreground. Uh, syntax, syntactic structures usually have uh, punctuations uh, not really at the background, but already given, already uh, taken for granted. But here, it's foregrounded. The, the, the punctuation, that, that's how the syntactic structure, and that is because of perhaps uh, 
beyond the consciousness of the composer of AJ is how he was trying to trying to dialectically uh, mix the gamelan tradition with the new music tradition. By the way, uh, the thing about Kiai Fatahila, I've mentioned oral tradition. The unique thing about Kiai Fatahila, this Iwan Gunawan's group, is that they read notes very well. And that, that's the good thing about uh, this, this ensemble. So if we look at, in that sense, syntax, a, a sense of having punctuations because it marks ends of phrases, etc. We see this foregrounded in this uh, composition. To take it from, from um, Sergio, from Tatay, about the punctuation. I think, um, so since the punctuation is the foreground and everything that's happening before and after, um, I think the materials in your piece were just, you know, dissolving and adapting, adapting the inner events and the energy within itself. And I think, yeah, this is, um, yeah, remarkable. Right. I would even probably go further, like uh, comparing this, for example, to uh, Kaya Sari House uh, for Blendungen, where you actually see a certain similar structure of, uh, of having sound that is being reduced eventually to certain crystals, uh, uh, strands of crystal sounds and all that, right? So like you see this certain similarity in terms of structure and all that, but, but the main difference is that uh, the ideas, the, the basic material is already kind of, uh, again, relying on the idea of the gamelan. And especially when we think about uh, ethnomusicologist and composer Jose Maceda's uh, idea of droning, for example, like his, his heavy investment on the idea that uh, gong traditions has a lot to do with the idea of gong sounds as vibrations. So here we actually see something that's just being, you know, sounded out and being let fade out, you know, as how, how a gong would actually sound like. So that's what I'm actually getting in terms of uh, how the, the whole thing structured in terms of syntax. So. But what really strikes me in every composition is how the personal and the, the, the inner mix of this, uh, the personal experience with the structural experience and is actually really this totality. It's very hard to pinpoint this is this, this is that. AJ looks at it, of course, from an experiential point of view, why he, how he's composed it, what has driven him to do this, and his, his personal, uh, this, this kind of reflexivity, which you call, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, what was striking was what he said about the conflict in silences, the conflicts in silences, and the illusions of memory, which actually uh, reminds me also of, of, of uh, of bell sounds, of uh, of of, of Ravel, Ravel's uh, Valley de Clocher, or 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 even Mahler's uh, Fourth Symphony, I think, or Sixth Symphony. I think it's a Sixth Symphony, mm -hmm. uh, where the the saddest part, apparently, he said, is is the part where he hears the bells. It's a bell sound, and, and which apparently is very reflexive. It's like uh, him sitting in the mountain top and. And because of his loneliness, could hear only the bells from afar. That, that kind of uh, that kind of reflexivity, which apparently the composer could give, which the composer can share with 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 uh, with the listeners uh, as as human experience. It's like we're, we're we're telling narrative, we're telling stories. We go back to this notion of narrative here, and in this piece, it's 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 not the linear story, but it's this this uh, narrative thing. Uh, I, I'm also reminded of the, uh, this piece by Nick uh, in this, uh, remember you had a piece for your graduation recital which was happening in, uh, in the, uh, in the Carillion. If, if you look around, uh, everything's happening and, and uh, and uh, you walk around and, and 
you say this is Nick's story in a way. I mean, it's always like that. Or or Jurakim's uh, piece uh, in in uh, in Kuala Lumpur. I hear it and I hear his story. I mean, uh, it's because of my knowledge of the composer and 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 I think. If we were to look back in Beethoven, uh, we see his story somehow in, in, in his, his piece. It's not really a story, exact story, but chunks of, of, of the thought processes that is, uh, that is uh, conditioned by the mind of the composer and his, his story, his experience. I think that's, that's very remarkable in every composition I, I, uh, I remember. Uh, composing. Uh, as uh, as composers, like composing experiences, right? So we, we we're not just like composing sounds. We're actually composing our own uh, ways of experiencing the world, and the, the composition therefore is really just uh, again like, very because it, our experiences are still far greater than the actual than the actual music, <laughs> and that, I would argue that. Uh, and I was actually struck with the way in which uh, imagery is also like even being uh, interspersed here in this uh, composition. If you look at the score again, like you would actually see certain like vignettes of some sorts. Like uh, there is this section called Weeping and in the Peace of Silence, Agitated, Into Eternity. And these uh, imagery, th these images are kind of like uh, pretty much like foretelling of what the universe uh, is you know being depicted or maybe not even talking about being depicted but more about being embodied here so yes we, we see i think uh, is it in section uh, i where we see uh, uh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right yeah, piece of silence yeah and it's like that part where a punctuation actually uh, allows a space for a silence and all that, which is kind of ironic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, you're talking about irony. Uh, and uh, I think related to this section, I wrote um, a piece for clarinet and soprano that uh, Pauline Arreola performed many times. So I, I wrote it for Pauline, Prayer of Serenity. And uh, I, that irony is always in my head because I can't really get any peace. Or I can't, in, when I'm silent, you know, I have in, if my, if my brain runs Google Chrome, there are around 10 tabs open. When, when my wife uh, uh, sees me just in the corner, just sitting, uh, she knows that I'm thinking of so much things. So, I mean, uh, in terms of meaning, and I was also thinking of syntax as meaning for the composer, because um, if we jumble and jumble words and, uh, for example, structural point in a paragraph or whatever, whatever type of communication you want, there are certain, there are certain uh, orders of words that would will only come out of one person and that's his or her identity and uh and i see also that in in composition we can you know jumble and jumble all the processes and you know and that kind of process is the identity of one composer maybe and so syntax is meaning is also um, something that just came out of my head. I'm also quite curious about the instrumentation as well, because um, so like we 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 see a piece being composed uh, uh, for Western instruments and also for non-Western instruments as well, and specifically in this piece it's the gamelan, right? Uh, and there are pretty much like selected instruments in regards to that, and mm -hmm. I think uh, color may also have. In, but uh, I want to talk about like this idea because um, I would probably pose the question uh, because there had been a time in uh, 
20th century music history where people were exploring uh, combinations of Western instruments and non-Western instruments for, you know, because of sonorities and all that. Are we already like beyond that kind of context of exploration or are we still stuck within that? Yeah, actually, I'm, 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 uh, I'm sick of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, to me, the greatest challenge is, is, is the color that comes out from whatever instrument you're using. Uh, I'm always, uh, I always look uh, whenever I'm, I'm confronted with that question. And uh, there's so many pieces now that use non-Western, so-called non-Western instruments. In fact, uh, the ASEAN even has an orchestra which plays pop music, uh, which is, it's, it's, it's like the uh, Cultural Revolution Orchestra in China, uh, which plays this ASEAN, C ASEAN ensemble. And we've seen this, I think AJ, remember in, in, in Nanning <clears throat> uh, in 2017. It's, so, so to me, it's, not, it's no longer a question of using instruments. And, and uh, they have been composing concertos for uh, koto and orchestra and all that stuff. That, that, that's not the very point. I think this notion of uh, creating sounds uh, from unfamiliar sources is, is, is no longer uh, mis a mystific, mystifying thing. I mean, the thing now is for me, we, we don't have to use uh, traditional instruments. Although it's it's good to use it sometimes because it can offer a different color, a different nuance. No? But the, I think the greatest challenge, and I think I'm I'm also coming from Lachenmann in a way, no, is to be able to create sounds from concert instruments that are actually like traditional instruments. It's it, it's it's like uh, the notion of. Uh, Music, music concrete, uh, music concrete, instrumental of Lachenmann, uh, where he discovered sounds, uh, and it also has a very social uh, dimension to it. If, if you see that creating sounds that are ideally from electronically generated uh, sources, being produced by players, which actually develops the playing technique, it develops the the technique even of composition i mean that, that's my that's that's the thing i always uh, say with regards to uh, to the use of non western instruments and because it has been mystified for a long time i said uh, that was a necessary evil for maseda because he wanted a new sound that would uh, confront or challenge the hegemony of uh, Western orchestral sound at the time. But Senakis also created at the same time a different sound from his compositions using the regular orchestral works. I mean, it was so different. And then comes Lachenmann in the 70s and Spallinger in the 80s and the 90s. I mean, uh, these things, this kind of developments of the musical vocabulary and the musical material based on explorations of sounds. I've mentioned one time how I was, uh, I was so uh, effect, affected. The, the first week I was in Freiburg uh, and there was this concert by Ensemble Recherche and they, not the first week, the first month or something. Uh, I was so homesick and all that stuff, not only for my family, but homesick for Asia. Uh, I was in a different world and then I listened to this, uh, the very opening of, uh, of uh, Dieter Mack's uh, Kamen Musik 2, where uh, I have told you it sounds like a gong aging. I said, wow, that's home. And I think th those things, I think we, we could use uh, that as to invoke memory, collective memory. Uh, I, 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 was, I don't think I mentioned last week in episode on the Tatlum Tagulay Lai that it wanted to address collective memory in that sense, so. Is electronic music today the, the equivalent of non-Western instruments 15 to 20 years ago? I don't know. Or the new organs in Bach's time, maybe, or, or maybe, I mean, these are, 
these are relative stuff. I mean, the new sounds, and I think uh, not only the sound, but also the the notion of creation should 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 continue to to develop. Uh, 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 there, there is one branch uh, in um, in the use of electronic media where they have these libraries, where they have this uh, thing, and 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 to be able to create an orchestra uh, in your computer, in your laptop, which sounds like the London Philharmonic, London Philharmonic mm -hmm. Orchestra. And mm -hmm. the fascination for, for uh, again, I was saying uh, maybe Jean Baudrillard uh, <laughs> influences that in my, in my, in my, in my gaze, uh, I would, I would see that as a fascination for the simulation of, of reality more than the reality itself. I mean, you're more fascinated by by the simulation of reality uh, in a way uh, music concrete instrumentalist like that or or what i'm trying to search for in in the use of traditional instruments but at least it's not uh it's not uh mediated by by technology i mean uh, i i i that's, that's the heidegger side heidegger side of my my thinking that I'm, I'm always worried about uh, technology in that sense. Well, I mean, at the time, it wasn't so much a fascination for the simulated as much as just pragmatism brought about by the realities of the situation. We didn't have access to an orchestra, but we had to learn how to write for orchestral instruments, sometimes in large ensembles. And it was a tool that we used. Um, it was good and bad. It was good in that we had this tool to be able to sort of hear how it sounded, except that's not really how it's going to sound if an orchestra actually plays it, so it also teaches you bad habits. Mm. But yeah, I mean, at least speaking personally, it was never really a fascination for this as opposed to the real thing as much as I didn't have access to the real thing, but I had access to this. I, apart from that... All those simulated instruments, you can actually control um, the nuances of the instrument. So um, mm. it's like double the work. Um, you are <laughs> writing for orchestra, and at the same time, you're also trying to control how it should sound like. And it's also how, how do you say this? Um, you're controlling how real, and, and to an extent, to how much real you can make this instrument sound like. And that's weird when you, for example, you have never uh, encountered this particular instrument before or never written for this instrument and you try to make it sound real. So <laughs> it's um, somewhat funny. <laughs> but since Kuyanik says we, did, we do not have access to the orchestra all the time. Well, we did not. Yeah. So as a film composer as well, I had to work with such things, but nothing beats a recorded instrument. So actually I still prefer to write for smaller groups so that I can record as mm -hmm. um, than using all the simulated instruments. I always think of the other side of the problem. Um, so if you are, uh, if you're used to using these things and then uh, there's another issue, not the composer side, but the the instrumentalist side. Um, I, I know of some productions who've used these libraries because the orchestra doesn't the 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 the, li the sampled library sometimes sound much better than the live orchestra. So there are I know of some productions in past years. And uh, so that's another problem. And so execution, for example, it sounds really nice in Sibelius with the expensive 20 gigabyte library for clarinet, but the clarinetist can't even do it in real life. So I have also some students who've written a lot of music just with these libraries. Uh, in another school where I teach, I, they are required to learn these technologies they are required to have final projects submitted using uh, realizations in these libraries. 
I remember back when I was working with these simulations, at first it was fascinating, I will, I will admit that. But I remember that highlighting what it was missing. It was missing, it was missing these small inaccuracies because when you're doing it with a computer, it's perfectly accurate. And I remember missing these small inaccuracies which added character to a particular performance, which made it different from other performances, which um, you can program, pero it's still not the same, if you understand my meaning. I mean, yeah. even if you're dealing with something that's very, very, very precisely written, that's, that's, um, that's conducted and that's very precisely conducted and that's done by a very um, precise ensemble, there will still be small differences. And I remember later in my, comp uh, in, in my career focusing on those differences, focusing on that human aspect that you cannot do with electronics. And I think that's what dealing with simulations taught me. I remember one time I was recording for a piece with guitar. So guitar solo for a film. And I made a click track because I had to synchronize some um, scenes mm -hmm. exactly how I wanted it. But it ended up that the guitarist was, um, he became so tired of playing my piece. He didn't want to play it anymore with the click track. And he said, please just, um, please just let me try without the click track. I will play as um, a tempo as possible, but I can't promise you, but please let me play without the click track because the piece is good and I want to play it, but your click track is stressing me out. Mm. <laughs> so I made him play it. And actually at the end, I used, that recording, that last recording without the click track, I use it with my film. It was not accurate at all points, um, but it synchronized perfectly somehow because I also showed the, the guitarist the film so he knows what's happening. And apparently that was the best take <laughs> and the most human. Uh, we, we speak about, uh, we speak about being human, which apparently uh, it's such a fluid thing right now uh, in our lives. Uh, it's, it's fluid what being human is in this sense. So we, we talk about being human as being imperfect in, the, in a way, right? I mean, uh, one of the things that fascinated me when I first heard Maceda's Ading uh, in 1978 was this thing where because things transform every minute the, the instruments change and this change this 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 juncture between what was and what is going to happen that that's what what i wanted to capture always uh uh this this thing and 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 in, in the first uh, in the premiere of patangis buaya many years ago in 2003 in in tokyo when when uh, i was working with this uh ensemble this recorder ensemble so they had sections yeah, there were sections very clear syntactic structures but i saw them you just have to flow into it don't think about it just let it transform and that notion of trying to transform i said it for a different purpose i said it because i wanted to subject them to this to this thinking that we are going to change but it doesn't have to be it has to be smooth and can you imagine the effect of that on the, on the consciousness of the musician? You could actually see him, see them transform. And that was what I wanted to capture. So I was fascinated that every time I, I listened to, to uh, either Ading or the Patangis Boya, I, I, I always wanted to listen to that transition from one, one minute to another. And, and, and that to me is being human. I, 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 that, that, that notion that that imperfect moment, that imperfect moment that uh, things transform. Uh, I, I could imagine the universe in that sense. Uh, in that sense, and I don't know if that is captured in the, in the, uh, when you're using 
uh, electronic media. I like to learn those things. Uh, can you set set up my laptop for these libraries? I like to play with them sometimes. So. <laughs> Probably it's also a good time to just like uh, wrap all of those discussions into like one uh, singular like um, idea. And I would probably like uh, invoke the notion of, uh, you know, articulation, uh, articulating spaces, right? Because mm -hmm. as much as we see uh, Trinity uh, using non-Western instruments at a certain point in time and space, because uh, it was all, you know, besides being circumstantial as well and all that, there are also things happening. Um, many other uh, uses of technology and instruments have also kind of like manifested the ways in which their spatial contexts actually are kind of embedded in. So in the case of uh, using electronic music, for example, like we see that in Europe and North America all, uh, because it's pretty much their imagination of modernity that kind of uh, fueled that to begin with, right? And, and in terms of Southeast Asia, we actually like had the, uh, we kind of have a fallback of like looking back at our culture and especially like in the Philippines, for example, where we also see uh, that we can actually use these instruments and all that. And it's not much about, uh, more about exploration nowadays, but it's really just like about really uh, expressing uh, abstract ideas and finding meaningful ways and more efficient ways also of just uh, exp expressing them. It's fascinating how this was performed live and, and in the future it will never be performed live in the sense that, I mean, I, it, it might not be performed live so that we could use uh, libraries to do all those stuff. I mean, that's, that's, that's the thing which I, I, would, I would lament that uh, situation and uh, uh, but but it, I think it's starting. Even what, what the COVID, the COVID actually is driving us towards that kind of direction. I I I, I would I would assume, although I I, I hope not. Right, I mean, so everything's going to be online. So if everything's going to be online, it doesn't have to be really performance in the way we know it. Uh, you could pre-record, you could pre-edit, you could you could act as if you're uh, performing, but you're using a different. You're using a library. You're using uh, you're a violinist, but you're using uh, you're using uh, somebody else playing. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it's like it's like uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, people are saying okay, ganyan na ngayon. That's how it is now. That's the new normal, etc. And it's going to be like that, and uh, it, it's going to be pathetic for the world in that sense. So, so do we say that the do we do this also with rituals? Uh, Ritual performances, the Dap Ai, for example, in, the, there is this ritual performance among the Kankanae called the called the Livliwa, where they are all seated inside a a room, a small room. The smaller the room, the better. The bigger, the bigger the the, the crowd of, of elders, the the council of elders singing for three days and singing leader chorus style. Uh, now we couldn't do that because of the COVID, so we're going to do a virtual. I mean, mm. it, it's so, it, it, it actually, it, it actually um, <laughs> makes my, makes my head spin to think about in those ways. So I think I, I uh, well, may probably do just like also like question it a little bit too. Like, yeah, uh, at the end of the day, like many, um, many, many would argue that it's, again, it's all about, uh, spa it's very spatial as well, uh, especially here in North America where uh, online learning, for example, has already been uh, pretty much an alternative to everything that's going on. And it's actually very surprising to, to know that in the Philippines, for example, in the University of the Philippines, like people were clamoring for, uh, to end the semester and to promote uh, mass promotion and all that, which is funny because you will never see those kinds of protests here in North America. Right, and this is where we see this disparities where uh, people's um, consciousness were more about here, more more about like let's try to actually make the economy run, and let's try to to actually pursue normality as how we know it. But now using technology, and it is really just like about different perceptions of how people uh, actually like uh, come up with the uh, using these tools and all that. It's, it's probably also cultural as well, right? So again, culture is space. Space is culture and all that. 
perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm still a disciple of Masedi in the sense that uh, uh, with, with technology, uh, we should transcend it. Kasets 100 is a transcendence of technology. Ugnayan is a transcendence of technology. It, it goes beyond uh, what technology can offer. It, it look, gives a different meaning to it. And that, that's, that's something which we should never forget. We should never forget. Uh, as, uh, in a performer's perspective, the experiential part, the experience of um, the human experience of interacting with another performer instead of uh, interacting with a click track or something, interacting with something you see on the screen. It's a different, um, the affect of the music, the, the purpose of the music doesn't transcend to the people the way it should when it's performed live or when it's experienced live as opposed to when you hear it to two speakers. The experiential part is, is not transcended in the way that it should be when you hear it uh, raw as it is. It never is. I mean, if you go back to the orchestra, I remember the first time I heard a, a full, complete orchestra live was in New Zealand. And you just don't get that punch in the gut from all of those, from the whole string section playing tutti. You, you don't get that with speakers. One thing I'd like to touch on, if I may, um, one thing that I found remarkable was AJ uh, mentioning that the music, the piece was intended for foreign audiences. We already touched on this, but um, there was a point that I kind of missed. Um, AJ mentioned that the, the Threna di Four was intended for foreign audiences. And um, I find that idea of exoticism interesting. It, it will be written for foreign audiences using Southeast Asian music, uh, Southeast Asian instruments. So it will be seen as a Southeast Asian writing for Southeast Asian instruments viewed by a foreign audience. Pero, um, but in fact, these instruments are as foreign to the composer as they are to the audience. Were you conscious of these layers of foreignness and exoticism being present? I mean, how much did that figure into it? Well, first rehearsal was the first time I heard the gamelan. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you know, I have a good sounding gamelan uh, as well uh, with the other young composers with me. It was all our first time hearing Asun. And Asun Danis gamelan. Uh, yeah. It's not a common gamelan uh, group, you know. Javanese so, ang alam ng mundo eh. Javanese or Balinese. Yeah. You know, the part of, uh, of it being, you know, exotic to the audience and to the composer as well. Um... <laughs> Without the audience being conscious that it's exotic to you. Well, we can always point. pretend that, we, that I know what I wrote, you know? <laughs> but uh, it's all just in theory. And um, it never, I think it never really permeated my consciousness that okay. um, it's as foreign to me as... To the audience, but it's not really. I think it's not really that foreign to the audience because it was premiered in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. You know, it's foreign I, I to the composers the who wrote for it. Yeah, yeah, the milieu. Of course, to the Germans who were there. There were so the German. I, I remember that was the festival. There were so many Germans. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the otherness was kind of like a pretty much like very uh, explicit anyway. Like even when I was listening to the to it the first time and see the score, I was like, yeah, oh yeah, so you want the Gendara to actually do this thing? It's like that's not the way Gendara is supposed to. Yeah, and maybe but, it's the other way around. It's the Western instruments who are foreign in Indonesia, and the mm -hmm. Indonesians listening to their own ensemble. We are the Asians, Southeast Asians, you know. I think it's the Europeans who are exotic and all of this, you know. <laughs> it is, yeah. I mean, in a very real way. I mean, we have to go to school to learn their instruments. It's yeah. not something that's normal to us either. I think that's a very, very relevant point uh, to make, especially
especially if you're here in North America where the diasporic community is really very present, you know, in the in the milieu and all that. Um, it's like uh, you see Filipino Canadians, for example, going back to their roots uh, by uh, looking at Kulintang traditions, for example, or or many migrant communities also moving here and bringing along the gangsa <laughs> along with them. Mm-hmm. So it's like, yeah, so we actually have all these pockets of communities and these kinds of musical traditions that were still being you know being practiced. Uh, just because, uh, just because of the the way migration, global migration, actually works, mm-hmm. and it's like, um, what diverges though is that the fact that uh, mm, the generational aspect of culture kind of kind of prohibits many people from also like understanding what the, these instruments are for or what this music is for and how it actually existed back in the, the point of origin, the homeland and all that. So the thing of otherness is also very much pronounced even among migrant communities themselves, right? So it's like, yeah, people can identify as Filipino can- Canadians, but at the same time, like, oh, I don't know much about you know, Philippine music, blah, 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 and all that. So I think that's a very relevant topic to really talk about, especially if you're um, situated in the diaspora. Well, in Southeast Asia now, I mean, uh, the trends in Southeast Asia, cultural production in Southeast Asia, especially with the ASEAN, the ASEAN as a body, the ASEAN as a, uh, it's a political economic body, actually. And, um, with all the uh, with all the mystifying things about the ASEAN as one body, etc., um, is that uh, this notion of uh, this notion of sameness and differences? Uh, they want to highlight what is different in each and every country, what is unique, but put them in one umbrella as one one economic agenda, so to say. You know, so. This I was mentioning a while ago, this C ASEAN Orchestra, where they have instruments from various, uh, from different ASEAN countries. Uh, you have a uh, nose flute there, whatever. You have a this or that and this and that from Thailand, from, from Burma, from etc., etc. And they have a repertoire. They have built a repertoire, which is uh, pop music. It's, 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 it's more pop music. And it's like a show band, actually. Um, well, I have I have nothing against it really, except that I'm also critical about it. What is it trying to say? This notion of otherness, and then they would present it to an ASEAN, an ASEAN modernity that actually doesn't see that as what they are. In the sense. It's like uh, I'm 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 invoking Benedict Anderson. Um, these cultural agents telling its citizens what they are. Mm. That that is the notion. It, it's telling them what they are instead of uh, uh, creating something exotic. This is what you are. It is that uh, that I think is also the agenda of of culture. In, in nation states and also in relation to tourism also. And that, that conflation between tourism and, and the agenda of culture, of national culture, the, the implication of tradition into national culture and, and not only national culture now in a bigger level, regional culture, I think uh, that was that was not in the agenda of the growth institute in their in their uh, in their uh, well in, in what they had in the past this 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 thing but to create a language that was unique to the experience of the people i think that that was very unique uh, for the growth uh, mm-hmm. uh, in the sense it's very different from what what people are doing now everywhere uh, you see this this and that and this and that festival. Which I try to I try to make the MCL uh, kind of uh, uh, sway from that to move away from that. Even cite one recent example because this is also what I've been questioning about. Like for example, the uh, the, 
th these cultural relations now being built between the ASEAN region and China, for example, we had this festival where Tatlong Tagulayle was premiered, I think. That was, it was, that, that was it, right? And it's like that, that having that uh, kind of festival uh, in the foreground, where in the background, like we have been talking, uh, like there are lots of the geopolitical tensions about uh, uh, the many Asian countries uh, and also China in terms of territorial disputes. And I was like, oh, how, can, how can we figure that where like this festival can exist amidst all those tensions? And, and I, I never got the answers for that because obviously like on one hand, you want to see uh, cultural relations, you know, growing and all that. Of course, like there are many Chinese people in, in Southeast Asia and so on and so forth and all that. You, you actually want to highlight these relationships and uh, build solidarity on that. But at the same time, at the background, like there are these uh, political uh, uh, institutions and uh, nation states, you know, arguing about like many specific, many very specific issues. I remember being in a music literature class and proposing to write a paper. We have paper requirements in these classes and proposing to write a paper about how Manila is a fulcrum for the enculturation and acculturation of the rest of the Philippines and being told, no, you're not allowed to write that with no explanation. That was strange. Um, that was in UP. And um, I don't know, I mean, some of these processes happen organically, such as the diasporic processes that Juro Kim was describing. And some of these processes are institutional. I don't know how organic those institutional processes are, but they, they come from economic, economic necessity or um, whatever. And we view one as okay and one as bad. And I'm starting to question why. Why is enculturation coming from an institution bad while enculturation coming from the people themselves moving and um, their children growing up in a different environment and intermingling? Okay. Bakit may ganong difference? Baka power, baka it's a question of power structures. Baka, because, because if it's a state, no, no, because, because I mean, I feel it that way. Because if it's a state, uh, that, that, that's my field, the cultural politics, that's my PhD anyway. Um, um, if it's a state that institutes, institutes, uh, whatever, is, is, uh, like what, what the, the National Commission represents in that sense, uh, instituting culture in that sense, um, uh, you would see a national agenda, which is not always, I'm saying not always, I'm not, I'm not saying not entirely, but not always in line with uh, what the people want, what the people need, what the people or, or what is true to the experience of the people in that sense, mm -hmm. in that sense. Uh, uh, implicating indigenous peoples as pre-Hispanic is already one, one issue. It's one, one issue which, which is actually always being rammed in the heads of, of the mainstream culture. But indigenous peoples, they continue, they, they, they struggle, mm -hmm. they, they should not be seen as these remnants of uh, of the past they are in the present but but they don't want to see and, and the funny thing is that the same state that tries to quote unquote preserve their culture is the same state that allows for multinational transnational let's say mining or logging industry which encroaches on the life of the indigenous peoples and their ancestral domain I mean, that, that is the greatest irony. And, and, and uh, what, what is culture then in that sense? What, what are we saying? What are we doing? I mean, uh, uh, in the sense, but, but if you look at Trenodia, uh, Trenodia and, and, and you see this as, as uh, the, the Trenodia, we're going back to Trenodia. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, this thing actually reminds me of the Sandaya piano of Burma. Have I told you about that in your past lives? When you were when you were studying with me, the Sandaya piano. Memory. Yeah, well, the Sandaya piano, the Sandaya piano. If if you like me to knock your memory a bit, the Sandaya piano is an is a way by which the in uh, traditional musicians of Burma 
uh, adapted the piano as their own. So mm. they created a repertoire and they can play a uh, traditional repertoire on this. Uh, the, 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 the fascinating thing is about, about this is that they also, re at, in, at, at first they were retuning the piano because the, the piano that was given by Queen Victoria to the King of Burma was out of tune. <laughs> so they had to retune it and so that it fits the intro. That's a fantastic development. And, and to see Treno the, or maybe in fact Mercedes Adi or Cassettes 100 or maybe even Patangis Buaya in that sense, as like the Sandaya piano, it's fascinating. I mean, I could say that with pieces by you, Nick, or by Juro Kim, by Feliz Anne, by Marie Louisa, uh, us in that sense, because that's what, what the ideals uh, is in, in, to my mind. Not this, uh, uh, I'm sorry to say, some composers who, who are so bugged about the, the otherness of the others, as if it was theirs to give. Um, I wanted to talk about maybe, but maybe for next time, um, in connection with like um, when you were just discussing about electronics or technology, and um, like simulation, and this maybe frustration of how um, we cannot get the actual sound that we simulated or or whoever is using technology to simulate the specific sound that you want in your piece and then trying to have it played by by the real person and maybe for the next discussion i i wanted to um focus on how um like as part of the composition then you became more conscious of the person playing and really knowing where, how he or she should play the instrument. So that um, in connection to what Kuyanik has complained that, which we always, we, or we most of the time um, experience, like one musician will say, this is impossible. And then just say, well, put your finger there and then bow it like this. And, you know, with this intensity and, you know, and when the musician sees that you know exactly how to do it, even if you don't play the instrument, you just know um, the property of the sound and mm -hmm. yeah, the gesture and all these things, then we can achieve um, this special sound, which maybe we usually um, could have, um, you know, have it simulated in in online, uh, in some applications. It's even more fun when it's the conductor that tells you that it's impossible and then the musicians in the ensemble say, yeah, that's doable. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that happens. So I guess it's already time to wrap up the discussion. And <laughs> <laughs> So I guess, yeah, it's time to just uh, wrap it up and uh, just watch out for the next uh, edition. <laughs>